Good evening and welcome to this event organised by the Centre for Geopolitics at Cambridge University. My name is Suzanne Rain and I'm an affiliated lecturer at the Centre for Geopolitics. The title of this evening's discussion is What Should a Reunited West Look Like? Now the alert among you will have realised that this is an imperfect question because if we're talking about a reunited West it makes an assumption that it ever was united. Some might say the term West itself is no longer the right descriptor. But if, if it was a, re, a united West and we're looking for a reunited West, um, is that even the thing that we need to solve our problems anymore? So I'm very pleased to say that we've got three excellent panelists this evening who hopefully will lead us through a really lively discussion about those questions and provide some answers. They are all people who've been academics and practitioners. And so I'm hoping that we'll really benefit from their experience and expertise. To introduce them, um, Dr. David Gordon is Senior Advisor for Geoeconomics and Strategy at the International Institute of Strategic Studies, IISS. And he's based in Washington and about to fly to Bahrain later for the Manama Dialogue. He writes extensively on global political and economic issues, on great power rivalry, and on US foreign and national security policy. He has an illustrious career, both in the US government, as Director of Policy Planning and State Department, among other things, and as Vice Chair of the US National Intelligence Council. Zania Wickett is Vice President of Political Analysis at Equinor. She also serves as a Commissioner for the Marshall Aid Commemoration Commission. Her previous roles have been as the uh, head of US and America's program at Chatham House and also Dean of the Queen Elizabeth II Academy for International Affairs. Um, she has worked in the US government, academia and nonprofit worlds on American foreign policy and South Asian geopolitics in particular. And Dr. Bart Shevchik, along with David McCain, is author of Partners of First Resort, America, Europe and the Future of the West, which is out very soon. Um, he is adjunct professor at Sciences Po in Paris, and before that was a member of the policy planning staff in the US State Department and senior policy advisor to the US ambassador to the United Nations. So welcome to you all. We're very grateful that you're giving us this time. Um, we're looking forward to it very much. I should stress that all the panelists will be giving us their personal views and they are not, when they're speaking, representing their institutions or organisations specifically. Um, you, the audience, are a part of this too. We're going to have a conversation for about half an hour and then I will um, put your questions to the panellists for the remaining half an hour. We will finish at 7pm um, UK time sharp. Um, please type your questions in the Q&A and state your name and your institutional organisation if you have one and your question Start typing early so that we can process them all in time, um, make sure that we, we ask them. And please, um, I apologize in advance if I don't manage to ask everybody's questions, but we'll try and um, do as many as we can. So thank you all very much for joining us. But I'm gonna start with you because you've just written a book on it. Um, I think it's fair to say that Western democracies and the Western Alliance feel like they've been through the ringer a bit at the moment. Um, could you set the scene for us by just telling us how, how bad it is? Great, well, thanks very much, uh, Suzanne. And uh, thanks very much to the Center for Geopolitics at Cambridge for hosting us. Obviously, <laughs> I think we all prefer to be at Cambridge itself uh, to enjoy the beautiful environment and the surroundings, but this is a, a good second best alternative. Look, I mean, I, I think it's been pretty bad over the past uh, four years, but it's not beyond repair. Uh, and I think with the new incoming team in the United States with the Biden-Harris administration, uh, we have a very good shot at uh, doing that repair quite quickly and also reimagining the transatlantic partnership for uh, the challenges of our time, which are quite different from what they were four years ago, uh, even, and will be also evolving into the near term future. I would just highlight uh, a couple of key things. You know, I, I think one of the main things that we'll need to do is to return what President Obama called an enduring truth of American foreign policy, which is that basically 
the road to success for the United States in foreign policy goes through synergies with Europe and vice versa. Uh, he called this an enduring truth of American foreign policy that basically US cooperation with Europe is our catalyst for global cooperation. And to be sure, <laughs> Europe and the United States alone uh, can't you know, deal with issues like climate change, obviously controlling the pandemic or um, stimulating the economic recovery or a host of other issues, but it's a very good place to start. And particularly for global challenges, uh, you need to repair the core engine of the West to make sure that the wider machinery works. And so uh, that's the key argument of our book, Partners of First Resort. Uh, and I think it's also something that's resonated quite well, both in Brussels and in Washington, DC. And interestingly, uh, the phrase partners of first resort is a term that President-elect Joe Biden used himself seven years ago at the Munich Security Conference to describe the transatlantic partnership. And it's also the term that HRVP Joseph Borrell used himself uh, a couple of weeks ago in his address to the European Parliament to describe US-EU relations. You probably would have noticed uh, in the Financial Times uh, and also published uh, today by the commission itself. The commission is working hard on a pretty comprehensive set of proposals to how to reimagine and reinvigorate the transatlantic partnership. It adopted a 12, 11 page plan today that will be reviewed later next week by the European Council. And look, it has a number of good ideas for how to take the relationship forward. But I think fundamentally we'll just need to start with first principles, which is that we are each other's core partners, and that's where we have to begin. Thank you. So that was kind of Sunday Uplands, I think, if I may be so bold. I'm going to um, try and unpick some of that because that, that, you know, I think that the synergies that you talk about, they're just not quite there at the moment. Um, David, I don't know if I turn to you. Um, I mean, this this sort of atrophying of, of the relationship, it's not just Donald Trump that's done that. I mean, it happened under under uh, President Obama and Vice President Biden as well. And I mean, obviously it's it's ebbed and flowed over the years. I mean, so how, so, how, yeah. So I think it's easy to blame everything on President Tr Trump. He invites that by his style. Uh, and it's certainly the case that among America's allies and the three sets of alliances, the, the transatlantic alliance, the trans-Pacific alliance, and the Middle East allies, mm -hmm. that, that by far the worst relationship during the Trump administration was the transatlantic relationship. Uh, so part of that was driven by tr Trump. Part of that was in fact driven by the fact that Trump was so unpopular in Europe that, that, that uh, it created a, a challenge for European uh, leaders to, to even engage very much in the relationship. And that's the big difference between uh, Europe and Asia here is, is that Asian leaders uh, did work hard because their publics were much less negative on Trump. They were, they were much less constrained. And of course, Trump didn't go after them in the way he went after the European leaders, particularly, of course, Chancellor Merkel, uh, 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 especially. So, you know, I, I do think that, that, uh, that for Vice President Biden, once he becomes president, the transatlantic relationship is going to be his first priority in uh, trying to restore the credibility of alliances. Uh, so I think that, that he's made that clear. Uh, so I do think the notion uh, of a priority to Europe will be there. On the other hand, on the other hand, you know, and it's recognized in the EU paper that, that 
the main challenge out here is China. And there are a whole set of allies, the US allies in Asia, Japan, Australia, South Korea, uh, others who are in much more direct uh, engagement with China uh, and face that as much more of a real threat. Uh, and so while I do think that Europe is first and Europe will be first for Biden, that, that I think the notion of a Western alliance in a geographic sense of the transatlantic reliance is probably not the way that the Biden administration is going to approach this, nor in my view should it be. Dania, I, I, having had a little conversation with you earlier, I think you probably agree with that. It would be good to get your take on, on what, that, what the alliance should be, the, essentially the alliance for good or, or whatever, whatever they're going to call it. So, so I think I, I mean, I agree with with uh, um, everything that's Bart, Bart has said thus far and, and, and everything that David said. Um, I think we have to have a little bit of um, uh, kind of realpolitik. You know, when I when I worked um, now a, a while ago, when I worked in the White House, I worked on South Asia. Um, and one of the things that um, really stuck with me is we tried very, very hard to get India to become a member of the Proliferation Security Inici Initiative, PSI. Um, they agreed with all of the principles of PSI, but they felt like it had been created in their absence. And they didn't really want to join a group that was almost them kind of uh, latterly becoming something that others had pulled together. Um, and so we struggled. Um, and so I, I fear a little bit that if we move forward with an agenda that is how do we re-strengthen the transatlantic relationship? Um, you know, how do we use that as the center point around which uh, we try and work on global issues? Um, we're almost doomed to fail. And so um, I think we need to kind of, kind of reconfigure our lens, if you will. Um, which is to say, and, and this, you know, I pick up on something that David just said, you know, what, what, is, what are the Biden administration's key challenges um, on January 20? Um, they're almost certainly domestic before anything else. I mean, COVID-19 comes first. Um, when you get into the international kind of domestic international scene, a uh, climate change is very high on the list. Um, trade jobs, again, for the domestic international nexus. Um, and then almost certainly America is going to look around and say, you know, where are our partners that have, and I think this is key, that have the key interests, the will, and the capability to work with us on those issues. Um, and, you know, as, as David said, you know, front and foremost for many in the Biden administration is going to be um, China um, and climate. And on both of those agenda items, I think that Europe is important, but perhaps some of our America's Asian allies are vital. And in one case, at least China is vital to deal with the climate agenda. And so entering into this with a, we're just going to talk to our European allies first, and then we'll come talk to the rest of you, is just not, is not a kind of politically astute thing to do. Um, I think that we're gonna, America's gonna have to be, and the Biden administration is gonna have to be a lot more uh, kind of subtle um, and careful in how, in how it orders its engagement. Um, the reality is, is at the same point, and then I'll, I'll end with this, you know, as, as Bart says, Europe in the end, does have many common interests with the United States, um, perhaps more than any other um, grouping. Um, and so it will often be our partner, but whether we should frame the conversation in that, in that context, I, I, I'm a little bit more skeptical. 
Can I yeah. respond briefly? Uh, yes, and can, I, can I ask? Yes, I want you to respond, Bart, but I want to add in a question so that you complicate your response because Zane has set out for us something which is which is really interesting. Which is said, actually, do we need to break stuff in order to recreate it? And when you look at Europe, you have the European Union, you have nation states who all have their own foreign and national security policies and climate agendas and all the rest of it and you have nato and then you have the rest of the world so so what are the component parts that we're talking about um and i think it's it's good to sort of dig into the the europe and transatlantic bit as a part of that well i, I didn't take from anything that Zenia said that we should be breaking up additional <laughs> institutions uh i know that we're at least virtually based in, in, in the UK, but uh, <laughs> uh, be that as it may. Look, I, I, you know, I, I didn't want to dwell too long on the argument of the book, but you'll notice that what we call for is uh, Europe and America as partners of first resort and obviously not only resort. And uh, to be sure, when you're uh, discussing issues like the challenge from China or uh, COVID or climate change, you'll need a number of other partners, uh, especially the Asian partners that David and Zenia mentioned, Japan, South Korea, India, Australia, and so forth. Uh, but you have to start somewhere. And uh, if you just allow me a little bit of an analogy, since uh, at least three of us out of the four panelists are in Europe, you know what we're sort of imagining in the book is uh, sort of like the Franco-German engine that makes the EU run. And it's, fascinating that notwithstanding all the European integration over the past uh, 60 years, just two years ago, France and Germany signed a new treaty uh, between uh, each other to provide for additional structured dialogue, consultation, exchange of information, and so forth, with good effect, because once that was reached, there was a sense that uh, the EU was going to kick back into gear. And that's the main argument. Uh, I don't think you know, and we could discuss what the alternatives are. Uh, David is uh, quite famous for having uh, supported very admirably this uh, D10 initiative at the Atlantic Council over the past decade uh, before Prime Minister Johnson made it famous uh, in the world. You know, you have that as an alternative. You have uh, the G20, which is, you know, just a construct at the leaders level from 2008. Uh, you have the UN General Assembly, <laughs> uh, the most inclusive club. And I think there are upsides and downsides to any format that you could imagine. Our basic point is that there's been a lot of damage done in the transatlantic relationship over the past four years. It's time for repairs, it's time for, to reimagine things. And, you know, we still think that this is a core engine for wider multilateralism. I'll just close with one point. Uh, even at this uh, last uh, Munich Security Conference, which was uh, titled Westlessness, uh, a little bit of a mouthful, but it was fascinating to see uh, a number of officials, including the Indian foreign minister, point out that, you know, when the West is not working together effectively, you can forget about multilateralism because you need to have a core uh, diplomatic, economic, and military engine somewhere to drive the agenda forward. Thank you, Bart. And, and it's it's worth emphasizing that um, the EU paper that came out yesterday. For me, I thought, you know, it's great that they're talking about these things. It is shocking that they haven't been talking about these things with America, given, you know, the amount that we talk about the climate in particular. Um, David, I'm going to turn to you and I'm going to merge my question with that of Roger Bass, who's the CEO of Global Standard, um, who says, is picking up on Bart's point, not all democracies are in the West. The South is right, and indeed not every country in the West is a democracy. The South is rising and the world is increasingly centered on other places, um, particularly the Indo-Pacific and Eurasia. So that kind of talks, I think, to, to what you were talking about with, with the D10. I wonder whether you want to. Um... Yeah, so, so, so the, if you're talking about architecture. I, I do think that, that there is an architectural change uh, that would be a useful one for the so-called Western alliance in which I include uh, 
the three geographic focal points, Europe, the Americas, and Asia. Uh, and I think that, that that is that I think that the G7 has outlived its utility. So the, the G7 uh, began uh, a, as a smaller number uh, focused on economic and financial issues as it expanded. Uh, it took on an increasing political function as well. Of course, in the aftermath of the, uh, of the fall of the Soviet Union, consequentially, Russia was asked to join. It became the G8, but then they, they were summarily <laughs> kicked out for good reason. So it went back to being the G7. So I do believe that the G7 construct needs to be expanded into something along the line of the, the D10. So it would be a concept that is centered around the like-minded, capable, and willing. So it gets back uh, to the, the points that the other speakers have made, but it is a larger group and it's a more diffused group geographically, right? Uh, so that, uh, and, and I think that, that in, in my view, that would make sense. You could either do it sort of expanding the G7 or picking up on the D10. It's always challenging to, to know where to draw the boundary here. So the boundary is always the toughest thing. Uh, and it, it's not surprising that, that um, one, one reason that it's been so hard to expand uh, the UN Security Council ha has been because once you start talking about Latin American countries, well, you know, the, the Argentines get upset if the Brazilians are going to go in. Uh, so, and, and regionally, Japan versus India in, in Asia, it's hard. Uh, now, I, I don't believe, I don't believe that the G20 is a, um, is a, uh, alternative to an expanded uh, G7 because it does not have adequate uh, like-mindedness. So I still do believe that we very much need a like-minded institution. It's not that the G20 has no function. I think the G20 absolutely has a function. I mean, we, uh, Bart knows this, that, that, that the, the working papers, uh, uh, in terms of upgrading the G20 from a finance minister's uh, to a head of government meeting uh, were written in the policy planning staff when, when I was the director during, uh, during the, the uh, 2008 financial crisis when, when we had to think about a more inclusive gr group for, for that set of issues, uh, but I do think something along the line of the D10 that would include the EU, uh, whether the number is 10 or 12 or 15, I don't know. But I, I do think the boundary question is a hard one. We were only able to come up with the G20 concept of taking the existing G20 and, and, and upping it to head of government because it pre-existed. Uh, and there isn't a good pre-existing notion. I don't think that, that having all the economies, the, the community of democracies, I don't think uh, captures this. So I do think that there is an, inter, uh, a, an architectural hole here to be filled. 
So Zenia, I think you wanted to come in, and but I also wanted to 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 comment on on that because the way David was speaking there, I sensed um, a sort of automatic U.S. leadership in the creation of something new. Um, and it might be that, frankly, what we've proved in the last four years is that we can't do it without the Americans coming up with an idea and making us do it. But um, over to you, Zenia. Um, <laughs> so, so, I mean, let me pick up that point, Suzanne, but let me say something else first. Um, I will use a very weighted term, um, and I think we need to get over it, which is coalitions of the willing, um, because... Um, as I look at some of the most effective, broadly defined, um, multilateral activities over the last, say, decade or 15 years, they have effectively been coalitions of the willing. Um, Afghanistan, Iraq, both military, they weren't NATO. They were coalitions of the willing that included many NATO members, but not all NATO members and some non-NATO members. Um, you know, G20, um, you know, and, you know, PSI, uh, you know, we, we can keep going. Um, and I'm sure that uh, my colleagues on the call can come up with, and actually the listeners can come up with at least 20 acronyms that fall into that category over the last 15 years. Um, and what this says to me is, is that's, you know, the, the, I keep coming back to something, you know, the world is moving more slowly today than it ever will. What does that mean? Basically, it's getting faster and faster and faster. And so in order to respond to the global needs, we have to become much more flexible, much more effective, much more faster moving, or else we're going to find ourselves um, coming too late to the party. And the way to do that isn't by being um, constrained by institutions that, um, you know, that, that, that have been necessarily long-standing and have big architectures and secretariats and consensus processes and, and, and. Um, we need to be more flexible. We need to be fast moving. Um, and that means being a little bit more kind of perhaps impromptu. Um, and so it means coalitions of the willings, which is what we're doing. We're just not calling them that. Um, and so to kind of David's point, I'm just going to, you know, just to, you know, I, I was also involved in the D10 when I was at Chatham House. I think it's a great organization. Um, you know, I think it's, it's really interesting. Um, but I don't think creating another architecture that, you know, has a secretariat, um, and ends up with a couple of hundred employees or a couple of thousand employees is the answer. Um, I think we need to have structures that include not just states, but non-state actors. I currently work for a corporate, you know, and one of the things that is top of my mind is what role do we have in addressing kind of social governance, environmental agenda items? And sometimes our role may actually be more pivotal than that of governments. Um, so I, I think we just have to be a little bit more, well, a lot more open about how we think about this um, and not feel quite so constrained. Um, and I've forgotten your question that you added on that was really interesting and I wanted to pick up on, but I've now forgotten well, what it was. My question, and now Bart wants to come in. So I don't, but the, the question was, because that you've, that, that's a compelling vision, but it requires, and it doesn't have to be the same state or non-state at the time, but it, it requires somebody to set it up. Okay, can I, can I just quickly pick up on that yes. and then Bart can, because I think it's important, which is um, the leadership. I come back to my interests, will, capabilities. Those are the three buckets. And so I think that what effectively, how does this take place? What happens is you have an entity or multiple entities who come together and say, we're really interested in achieving this objective. Um, we have the common interest, we think about it similarly, we have the will to do it, it's high on our priority list, and we have the capabilities to enact it. And so they come together and they bring as many other people and that group changes each time, depending on what the issue is. Um, so to David's point, you know, the G G um, G20 stood up in 2008, maybe it's time for it to stand down. 
because actually it's not the right construct for the challenges that we're now faced. And actually we need a different construct. So in many cases, the reality is, is that the big challenges that we face are going to require America's involvement. They're gonna require China's involvement too. They're probably increasingly gonna require India's involvement. They're gonna require European involvement. So the, the participation varies. Can I think of things that don't require America? Yeah but they're pretty few and far between and they're not probably top of the global importance <laughs> list. But. Um, well, I, I can't respond to everything, all the great comments that David and Zenia made, but let me try to just pick up on a couple of things. You know, um, my book publisher uh, instructed me not to preview the whole book. Have you got a book coming out, but I mean, it's uh -huh. not clear. Um, just to <laughs> just to whet everyone's appetite. And so I don't want to be misunderstood that we're uh, what we're proposing. And we do have a new Atlantic Charter outline in the book uh, and the Transatlantic Council, but these are actually all relatively flexible institutions akin to a G7 or a G20, which don't require a secretariat or uh, a headquarters or anything like this. And it's just a, you know, a different way of thinking about issues. And I still think that I agree uh, with Zenia on, you know, the need for common interests and capabilities and leadership. Although, <laughs> if I may, not to rehash old history, but I think it's the first time in years that I've heard the Iraq War offered as an argument in favor of something. And you know, usually, it's <laughs> an argument uh, against uh, anything that's offered uh, that's associated with it, including. The coalitions of the willing, which the main problem is the, that even though the theoretically it's an attractive concept, it becomes very chaotic and unmanageable. And so what we have seen actually in practice is uh, leaders and countries and, and organizations wanting to structure their decision making in some orderly, coherent manner. And so it was fascinating at the time of the 2008 financial crisis. What did people do? They didn't, you know, try to create something completely out of whole cloth. They fell on an existing institution, the G20, which previously met at the finance minister's level, and said, "Let's meet at the leaders' level and kick it up a notch." And you know, there the coalition made sense because it was eighty percent of world's GDP and trade and so forth, and so it was the right format to respond to the economic crisis. And I certainly agree that's not the right format for all issues. But you know, in some ways, this is the fact of modern life. That in some ways, things are perhaps a little bit too fast changing and too chaotic that we need structures and institutions to be able to make sense out of things. And I would want to just a uh, final comment, resist um, you know, this institutional aversion sometimes that people have. Uh, you know, if you look over the past several decades, each decade has marked you know, a new chapter G7 in the 70s, then you had, you know, the enlargement of EU and NATO in the 1990s and 2000s, you had the OSCE as an institution in the 1990s, failed initiatives like the Community of Democracies in the 2000s, which, you know, they really uh, take off uh, to match its intended vision. Then you had the G20 in 2008. In some ways, you know, the D10 is, is good because it's an existing format that is easy. In some other ways, you know, it's a product of 10 years ago or 15 years ago. And uh, the main issue that I would have, or the main downside that I would see with it is that it excludes a lot of countries that you would want to be on board, especially when you're discussing issues like Russia, uh, especially when you're trying to get countries to commit troops for peacekeeping operations and for uh, projecting stability. And a lot of those countries will come from Central and Eastern Europe and uh, other NATO and EU members that are not included in the D10. And so very quickly you wind up branching out to a large, uh, a much larger uh, grouping. I think we can also uh, at some point maybe um, uh, discuss some of the specific issues because I don't want uh, the audience to be, uh, to mistake us as, as focusing only on the formats and the institutions because ultimately what we're trying to figure out is you know, what are the main principles and ways of thinking to address some of the challenges, the real challenges that we have in front of us? So I think, Bart, that's, that's the key, isn't it? Is that 
quite a lot of these challenges have been really long running and we've got a whole load of institutions which don't seem to have actually really fixed any of them and some of them are kind of almost now globally accepted to be no-brainers like like improving climate um, work others are really more complicated and David I'm going to turn to you and ask a little bit about intervention so there has been a horrific war in Syria for most of the last decade there are millions of refugees including in horrendous circumstances inside the EU and and can a coalition of like-minded people actually have proper effect on difficult problems and and I suppose you could say there will be some some things where where they can because the problem is essentially one that you've solved through consensus but others typically like a long-running civil war it, it's going to be harder than that so don't you sometimes need a coalition not of like-minded but including non-like-minded in order to actually deal with the tricky yes. stuff so it's definitely the case that that um that, that no one is arguing that 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 like-mindedness should define the whole of diplomacy, uh, <laughs> and particularly around conflicts, you obviously have to have the non-like-minded, uh, and and it's these are these are tough issues. I mean, I think that the, that one of the first crises that uh, the Biden administration is likely to face is probably going to have to do with a series of issues around U.S. relations with Turkey. One of which will be, I think, what is what looks to me to be brewing as a a Turkish offensive against the Syrian Kurds. Uh, you also have the issue of the S-400s. So U.S.-Turkish relations that, that have not been great, but despite that, there's been a very close tie between President Trump and President Erdogan. That's going to change. So, uh, and then that gets to the whole question of, oh my God, the first crisis for a Biden administration is with a NATO ally. Uh, so Did you see what happened today as well? I think Secretary of State Pompeo and the Turkish Foreign Minister had a to do <laughs> public argument in a NATO summit designed to reinforce um, collective endeavor. Yeah, so this is <laughs> this is real challenging and and I do think that in the United States, that, that President Trump got a lot of support for his notion of bringing to a close the ending US military engagements in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, I think that, that Biden, who will inherit very small uh, um, tr troop deployments in those countries will, will, will probably move in the same direction. So intervention, intervention, I think, is going to be one of these very, very challenging issues uh, for a new Biden administration, who I think will come in, frankly, sharing a lot of what was the Obama administration's skepticism around this. Thank you. Now we're going to go to our audience questions. And the first um, I'm going to ask is from our director at the center, Professor Brendan Sims, who raises the trickiest question of all, which is um, Brexit and the question of how important the UK really is to the US in relation to other European partners and how that will shape Biden's balancing of the Good Friday Agreement with the need to maintain good relations with the UK, which has been and continues to be, particularly on Russia and China, its strongest ally. Who wants to go first? Any, it's your turn. Um, okay, so let me um, just say a couple of things about this. Um, 
Um, uh, I think in foreign policy terms, in impact terms, in influence terms, the UK has rather shot itself in the foot um, with Brexit. Uh, so uh, I won't get into the, the kind of emotional uh, uh, and even um, practical benefits that might come around from Brexit in all sorts of areas. But in terms of the UK really being an influential actor on the global scene, notwithstanding um, global Britain, I think that the UK has rather shot itself in the foot. Um, and, and for the coming years, um, the next couple of years, for a couple of reasons. I mean, the first is because the UK is going to be so focused on kind of standing up its own capabilities um, and how it manages. It's going to be, um, you know, uh, what I would, kind of an old fashioned expression, it's um, naval gazing, very internally focused, which is going to make it hard for it to um, work internationally. Um, a lot of its resources are going to be spent on negotiating new um, trade agreements and the like, which means um, less resources to apply elsewhere. Um, and the UK as a um, intermediary, if you will, between the US and the EU um, is pretty unlikely. Um, and, and that's been true, frankly, um, for a number of years now. I mean, the, U the US um, looks first to Germany. Um, and then France, if it wants to talk about um, EU issues. So, so that's one thing. I mean, I think it's going to be awfully hard for the UK. Um, the second thing is, I think that um, Biden has made very clear um, how importantly he holds the Good, the Good Friday Agreement. Um, I think that when his administration and, and specifically the White House, this may be different coming out of the State Department, but specifically the White House looks at the United Kingdom, it looks at it in that lens of, um, of Brexit and uh, how that's going to be playing out for Ireland. Um, and I think, again, seen from the White House specifically, um, its engagement with the UK is going to be through that lens um, and that will be paramount. Now, it may be different um, if you sit in the State Department, um, but in the end, if the um, next administration function, functions effectively, um, it will be a bringing of the White House position, the NSC position and the State Department position together along with defense and, and others. So I think, uh, I think it's going to be pretty uncomfortable for the UK and I don't think that the UK should um, think that um, because it has similar interests. Again, I'll come back to my interest, will and capabilities. Um, the interests may be similar to the United States. Um, it's not clear to me that the will is going to be there for the next couple of years as, as, as I say, the UK is introspective and the capabilities pretty much aren't there at the moment. David, um... Yes, and David, actually, uh, just thinking forward as well, because by the time Biden becomes president, yes. the UK will have Brexited, so he doesn't yes. have to deal with this, the, you know, the, the problem. Um, he doesn't have to take sides now, but he may find himself unable to avoid getting involved in the aftermath. Yes. What do you think? So, I have one comment, and then I want to broaden the discussion a little bit. Bit here. So, so I do think that the EU, the UK, and the US share an interest in sustaining uh, cooperation and collaboration on the security and defense issues that, the, that, that they will remain integrated with in terms of NATO. So, so I think NATO actually becomes more important now uh, in the context of Brexit because the UK is still one of the most capable uh, European powers. Uh, but I, I agree broadly with Zenya's point. I think that, that, that the, the, the UK is a bridge between the US and Europe that's completely over. But I think there's a larger challenge here, both for Europe and the US, and that has to do with the other thing that's gonna be over uh, 
in the latter half of next year. And that's the long chancellorship of Angela Merkel in Germany. So, so Henry Kissinger famously asked several decades ago, uh, if I want the Europeans to do something, who do I call? Well, for the last 12 years, you've called the federal chancery in Berlin. That's not inherently true. That, that that may not be the case in the aftermath of the next German election. And I think we take, we often take Angela Merkel's leadership in Europe almost like a public good, that, that it's not gonna be really felt until it's not there anymore. Uh, but you no, know, the, this is going to be a big challenge because, you know, who will be leading Europe during this time when I think that the, the, the discussions and the dialogues with the United States are not going to be easy. Uh, that, that technology issues, privacy issues, those are, those are still uh, quite, uh, quite different. The whole uh, purview of regulation, trade issues, not gonna be easy. Uh, and, and I do think that, that there, there's not just one challenge, the Brexit challenge, but I think there's the Brexit challenge plus the Merkel leaving uh, challenge and, and it's it's not inherently the case that the next German chancellor will play that role, particularly at the beginning when you know that chancellor is going to have to put together uh, what's likely to be a very, very challenging coalition uh, between the CDU CSU group and the Greens. I just uh, yeah, first. Add, 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 a yeah. couple, add a couple of comments, which is, you know, on, on on Brexit and the and the UK's role in wider US foreign policy, let me just add a, a tone of uh, slight optimism, perhaps uh, uh, being in Brussels or uh, as an American. But uh, you know, I think the UK will still uh, play an important role in US thinking, um, as Suzanne mentioned. Once President like Biden uh, comes into office, it will be after Brexit. And so long as the sanctity of the Good Friday Agreement is preserved uh, and the UK you know, can sort out its negotiating issues with the EU 27, I think there will be a, a very strong interest both in the White House and the State Department and the wider US machinery to make sure that the UK continues to be a strong European partner in collaboration with the EU 27, be it within NATO, and that's uh, a great format uh, to still unify all three parts, as it were. But, you know, uh, we could also think of other uh, areas where the three sides should cooperate together because it will just be impossible to fit everything on NATO's agenda, be it climate change, COVID, um, economic recovery, or even an issue such as China, which is now part of the debate within NATO, but obviously has a much more complex uh, set of dimensions. Let me just add a, a, a one brief word on Kissinger's uh, quote from uh, several decades ago. You know, I think he was essentially underscoring the centrality that he had within the US government machinery. And that if there was any ever, any issue on which he wanted an answer, you would call him. But normally, you know, it doesn't work that way. You have a group of people that you need to consult with and you need to generate consensus uh, with. And with, you know, everything, all the leadership that uh, Chancellor Merkel has been able to play in Europe, uh, you know, you, there are lots of other leaders are uh, also very important and you, you need to get on board to be able to deliver on anything. Uh, first and foremost, French President Macron, but also you know, now the European Commission uh, uh, president, the president of the European Council. At, at a certain point, you're talking about a group of 15, 20 people they need to build a center of uh, gravity around and a consensus within because ultimately you just can't uh, uh, pick out one person and expect them to do the job. And it's interesting if you, I'm nearly done with 
uh, President Obama's memoirs, and he points out that you know he was quite disappointed in a number of individual leaders for not being able to develop, you know, deliver on economic recovery or on climate change or uh, uh, the Greek crisis or a whole host of other issues. And I think uh, as central as Kissinger was in US foreign policy, I think we should uh, not use that as the benchmark for modern policymaking because I think even in the U United States context, it's always a lot more complicated. And you know, even if you convince the US president, then you're talking about, you know, do you have Congress on board? Uh, is it constitutional? Uh, will, will it survive muster at the Supreme Court and so forth? So uh, uh, it's a you know it's not a one person show anymore. It is, although I, I've been reflecting that the more President Macron talks about his vision for Europe, the more he's talking about President Macron and France. Um, <laughs> so there's, I think there's work to do there in terms of getting one Europe. And I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm going to try and merge two questions. Um, and then they'll come, Zania, to you first. The first is from um, Naman Habtom, who's at the University of Cambridge, who, um, who's asking about, about Europe um, and essentially um, European interest, the, the, the risk that in renewing an alliance with America, Europe makes, its, makes it harder for it to achieve its own interests. And he's talking in particular about European Russian rapprochement or an, a, an independent European policy towards China. And then um, the second question from John Brookshire, who's um, an alumni of Sydney Sussex College is, what's the most important thing that Europe is offering America as its share in that, you know, so, so what's in it for America? I and mean, what's the most important thing? But I think, I think that, that question about, um, you know, if you think there are 12 EU member states who are in a partnership with China, the 17 plus one, that there's, there's some way to go before you have like-minded there, and maybe they, they want to pursue a different policy on China. Zania. I think, I think they're, both, they're both great questions. Um, and, and this kind of picks up perhaps some, something that Bart was just saying. Um, and I think this is the, 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 the challenge that Europe has. And Bart's absolutely right. There are multiple, um, always multiple actors whose interests you have to understand and take into consideration. But the more players you have, the more differing interests and priorities of those interests you have, the far harder it becomes to bring people together um, to take action um, in anything meaningful. And so, um, you know, th this question on, you know, will a uh, uh, EU, stronger EU-US relationship harm the EU or the European Russia relationship or, or you know European attitudes towards China. I would say you know Europe has to sort itself out before it worries too much about what America's influence is going to be uh, on its policy. Um, you know it's not clear to me that there is a European Russia um, uh, approach or attitude or position. It's not clear to me that there is a European China, approach or attitude and so so I just I don't I don't think uh, engagement with America is really um, going to damage something that I don't I personally don't think exists um, so so I think I think that's how I would answer the first question is it could you um, turn it the other way around and say it, given that there is no European position on Russia or European position on China doesn't that make it very difficult for the alliance to and, and, that, and that's that's my counter to Bart's point, <laughs> excuse me, which is that in a world in which America has a position and it wants to see who's kind of in a common space, excuse me, <coughs> it's hard to engage with Europe because there isn't a European position. And so, you know, you are inevitably engaging with multiple different members of Europe in order to, to move forward on an agenda. And of course, for any American who is also a Europeanist and a European Unionist, if you will, you kind of also don't want to do that because if you're engaging with France and Germany and Italy and Spain, et cetera, you're weakening the European Union. And so you're kind of stuck in a little bit of a quandary uh, mm. as an American. So, I mean, I think there's an inherent tension there. And I think that the, before we start really talking about, or if we're going to talk about a Western a transatlantic alliance, then, then I, I still come back to, I think Europe needs to kind of figure out 
what is the European position on a number of issues if it really wants to have the kind of power that would come with the European Union. Um, the, the, um, the, the question about what's the most important thing that Europe offers America, um, I, I think there's really two, two key things. I, used to, I, I did a lot of work back when I was at Chatham House on looking at the US-UK relationship. And I used to say that the UK-US um, relationship or what UK brings to the US is three things. It's a stool with three legs. The first is a kind of defense intelligence leg, you know, where the UK really, and I think David made this point, UK really does bring a lot to the table um, on both of those, that kind of that security agenda, if you will. The second leg was as a uh, go-between, as an as a interlocutor between the US um, and EU. And the third was as a partner. You know, it's far better for the US not to go it alone to actually be able to say, this is a group of us who are putting forward a position. Um, you know, the, the UK has clearly lost one of those legs, um, arguably still retains the same two, but you can kind of say that also of the EU. So what is it the EU or European Union brings to the US? It's really, it's, it's capabilities in, in the security space, um, both soft and hard, maybe you to use uh, Joe Nye's kind of smart uh, terminology, but also the idea that the UK, US isn't going it alone. This is not the US kind of displaying its hegemonic um, kind of strong polarity. And I, that is, continues to be an important thing. But again, lots of our allies can also do that. Thank you. Right, so to the two of you, we have got four minutes left. So who wants to go first? Uh, well, I'll be very brief before uh, letting David uh, sort out our <laughs> nuanced disagreements and, and uh, providing his insights. Look, I, I think you'd be actually quite surprised that there is, there is actually a European strategy on Russia it was adopted four years ago and uh, you know, has identifiable pillars uh, centered around ending the conflict in Ukraine uh, and persisting with economic sanctions against Russia until uh, that conflict is resolved. And interestingly, it is actually codified in a way that uh, the US strategy towards Russia which was largely very similar. You can look to speeches by senior officials to, to divine the exact content, but it was never actually published or codified in any uh, presidential speech or any official document. Uh, on China, there is a document from last year uh, adopted by the Commission and the External Action Service, again, laying out you know, a, a viewpoint on how to approach China. And look, obviously, none of these, uh, neither of these strategic documents encompasses everything and resolves all policy questions, but you know it's a good start. And the important thing is that it's a good place to generate further consensus around, uh, including with countries that right now are part of the Belt and Road Initiative. And uh, you, know, you need those countries as well. Uh, and incidentally, they probably would not be part of the D10 where you, would, you, know, you might have the D10 communique saying, oh, don't cooperate with China on this. And then you in fact don't have the right countries at the table. Uh, I would say one other thing that, the, that Europe brings to the table, and that's just its sheer economic weight. And if you're talking about regulating technology like 5G or figuring out you know, what sort of data protection you have, you know, stuff that's actually quite technical and beyond my expertise, uh, you need uh, the machinery of the EU and the individual uh, EU member states, as well as the UK, because each country will, you know, participate in various institutional structures, but ultimately will control policy in these areas nationally. And so I think, you know, you need a big tent approach uh, to these issues. One final closing point on the UK, you know, um, it was striking that when I was in the Obama, Obama Biden administration, the UK was always the partner with uh, which we aligned uh, we were most likely to align in terms of vision and so forth. And I think it's going to continue to be an important partner, not least of which on sanctions, but also a whole host of other uh, issues. And not just, I'm, I'm not saying that just because we're in Cambridge. <laughs> no, but we'll, we'll believe you. Thank you. David, you've got the last word. One final point. I'm actually reasonably optimistic about the transatlantic relationship. Uh, and I'm reasonably optimistic about um, you know, uh, this larger alliance approach partially driven by the, the challenge, the, the mutual ch challenge that China is going to pose. 
I think where, where the issue is going to get really tough, going back to, to Xenia's uh, old stomping grounds of South Asia, is the role of India in this. Because India, on the one hand, is this huge player. The Chinese have mishandled India very dramatically, uh, alienated them. The change in attitude in India is stunning. Uh, on the other hand, they are not nearly as like-minded as uh, the other democratic countries in Asia, in North America, and in Europe. Uh, and, and I think the, the India chat, how to fit India in here, uh, both on what India is willing to do and how far uh, the, the, the degree of like-mindedness goes, that's going to be, a, I think, a very big challenge. Thank you, David. And, and I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. I think we could have, I think what this is, what this is identified is that it's going to take quite a lot of talking to come up with the new solutions. But I, for one, I feel like I've learned an awful lot from the three of you. And I've got some new ideas from the three of you that, um, well, Hopefully we'll take them forward. Hopefully some of our audience are going to implement them in, um, in the future. I would love it if that were the case. Um, but thank you all for your time and um, we really appreciate it. And I hope you, the audience, have enjoyed it. I'm going to say have a good evening now and thank you for being with us. Bye.